Hi everybody. Uh, today uh, this is uh, Ask Andrea live, and for the uh, thanks <laughs> for the for the past few weeks, um, people have been entering questions into my website. There's a on the sidebar on my website. There is a uh, a little photo that says Ask Andrea. Input your questions. So people have been inputting their questions. So right now, this is where I'm going to answer the questions. So let's see. Where do we start? Where do we start? We're going to start with, um, uh, let's start with, oh, actually there was a good one that came in that said, um, uh, and this is from Holly, and Holly says, is there a time of year when it's not a good idea to do a detox? Yes, absolutely. So you don't want to do a detox if you are in a state of deficiency, if you are suffering from bone loss, and a time of year that you don't want to do a detox would be in the winter time. So like in the middle of the winter time, you actually do not want to do a detox unless you're in a, in a serious condition, right? Like you have, um, I don't know, you just had a heart attack or uh, you're going through cancer or something like that. Then, it, you know, it's okay to detox. But generally, in the middle of the winter time, you don't really want to be detoxing. You want to be building your body, you want to be holding on to your reserves because this is the time of the year where your body really dips into the bones. Literally, it dips into the bones if you don't have enough reserves, right? So a lot of times people will feel more bone uh, problems in the winter time, more creakiness, more achiness, more pain, more, uh, you know, can't get out of bed in the morning, stiff, right? All that stuff happens in the winter time. So generally, I don't recommend a detox in the middle of the winter time as your body, like I said, is already in the reserves of the bones and you don't want to make that, you don't want to dip down even deeper. So save your detox for the spring. Best time of year uh, to do a detox is in the spring or in the summertime. You can even do one in the fall so that you don't go into winter with um, a lot of heavy, <laughs> you don't want a lot of heavy mucus. And I just covered that in my um, respiratory health cooking class which was last month in November. You don't want to go into December and January and February with excess mucus in your lungs because if you get a cold or a flu, it's going to stay there for months. It may stay there until spring. Um, so let's see. Second question. Um, oh, I, there were some good ones. So Anne, Anne wrote in, she said, best foods to enhance dopamine production in a Parkinson's patient. Uh, Anne, actually... There are lots of foods that can enhance dopamine uh, production, but the, one of the things that you have to be conscious of is that the majority of those hormones are actually manufactured by bacteria in the gut. So, I mean, of course, they travel to other parts of the body. Your, your dopamine is going to be released from the brain. It's very important for brain health, right? So if the majority of the bacteria in the gut is responsible for dopamine and serotonin and all that stuff. You have to make sure that the gut is in good working order because you could put in foods that support dopamine that are, you know, foods that are rich in tyrosine uh, help to support dopamine production. So it's an amino acid. You find it in eggs. You find it in, uh, you know, fish. You find it in a lot of different foods. You could even find it in um, you know, lots of vegetables, Brussels sprouts and all that stuff. But if you're not absorbing, if the gut is not well, Hi, Hillary. <laughs> Hi, Sandy. If the gut is not well, then then the, the production of dopamine would be suppressed, right? So, you know, I could certainly tell you the best foods to enhance dopamine production, but the first thing that you got to make sure of is that this person's gut is able to absorb those foods on a deep level. So you want to make sure that their gut is healthy, and that includes sitting down to meals, relaxing, breathing, Making sure the body's fully relaxed before food goes into the pie hole, right? Because food goes in and we just bite and swallow and that's a big problem uh, because it, it, it causes digestive distress as well as you won't be able to absorb as efficiently. So, um, you know, uh, like I said, first thing that you want to do, Anne, is make sure that the gut is in a healthy state. And also another thing that enhances dopamine production is exercise, you know, exercise as well as sunlight. So all of these things will help to uh, enhance those feel-good neurotransmitter hormones, right? So uh, a, a hormone in the brain is just called a neurotransmitter, <laughs> right? Neurobrain. 
a little bit of apple cider, hot apple cider <laughs> with ginger in it. Um, so let's see. So the next question came in, and this was from uh, Rochelle. And Rochelle says, depression, motivation, mental clarity, and weight gain. And again, for those of you that are just hopping on, people have been putting in questions on my website. There's a, a section for Ask Andrea, and they put in their questions, and that's what this is. I'm answering the questions now. Hi, Patina, Patina, and Jennifer. Hello, everybody. Um, okay, so she says, Rochelle says, depression, motivation, mental clarity, and weight gain. Okay, you can see how these are all connected, right? Or I can see how they're all connected. Uh, so... First thing is, there was no question, right? These are just depression, motivation, mental clarity, and weight gain. What about them? Obviously, this person is suffering with this stuff. So the first thing is, with the depression, again, we have to get outside. So even though they're, you know, it's getting cold out, especially for northeastern United States or, you know, certain parts of uh, uh, Europe, you know, we're all having this winter time right now, you know, the other half of the planet is in summertime, but there's half planet in wintertime. So we have le access to less sunlight. But it's not that we have access to less sunlight. Part of it is that we don't get out as often. So to help lift the depression, this person has got to get out of the house, get some morning sunshine. Um, you know, that for the, you know, that both for the Parkinson person and for the depression person, morning sunlight is going to help increase the levels of, of serotonin as well as dopamine in the body or your ability to produce dopamine. Um, motivation, as the depression lifts, the motivation will, will, you'll have more clarity, you'll have, be more motivated to do stuff. And also, Rochelle, I would highly recommend in the springtime, I mean, you know, of course you could do a lot of stuff for depression right now, um, but in the springtime, do a liver cleanse. Because one of the things that happens with, in traditional Chinese medicine, the liver channel, right? This is the creative channel. It's the ability to wake refreshed and inspired in the morning when the liver is functioning well. If the liver isn't functioning well, um, there'll be lethargy, depression, um, can't get out of bed in the morning, don't want to get out of bed. What's the reason to get out of bed in the morning, right? There's nothing to do. I can't do anything. Uh, so uh, I would suggest really in the springtime, think about doing a liver cleanse. But for right now, Get out in the sunshine in the morning, eat foods that are um, sustainable, meaning they have a, a longer, uh, you know, they're not quick to spike your sugar. So like stay away from the donuts and the, you know, sweet teas and sweet drinks and crackers and all things that are going to spike your sugar and make you go up and then bring you back down again. With depression, you're already in a down state and you don't want to have these spikes. You want to be more even keel. So like, a, a nice supportive breakfast for someone suffering with depression. You know, sunny side up eggs, right? With the egg yolk, right? Sunny side up, right? Sunshine helps to lift depression. So um, you want to make sure that you're getting sunshine. You're getting sunshine in your food. So that includes plants. Uh, all of the leafy greens. These are rich in sunshine. Um, you know, roots are also great. Uh, because they help to keep you grounded, right? So you have this element of grounding with roots, so like burdock root, carrots. Um, even, you know, I, I, I know there was a book many years ago, it was like Potatoes, not Prozac, was the name of the book, and it makes sense. So potatoes, right, they, they do have glucose and carbohydrate and all that stuff, but they're going to be, they're going to react differently in your body than a potato chip. Uh, right, so if you have some rosemary roasted potatoes, which are totally delicious, the rosemary helps to stimulate circulation and blood flow to the brain as well as the extremities, um, helps to improve mental clarity. The potato is going to be the glucose that you need for energy, right, because all of our cells need energy. Uh, you know, like uh, a lot of times I, I'll hear from people that are doing like paleo and all these extreme diets and, and they take out all carbohydrates and then they have a crash, right? They're great for a long time and then they have a crash. So, um, oh, hi, everybody. Hi, Marissa. <laughs> uh, so the questions that are coming in now, you guys, these questions I'm answering, they came into my website. So for those of you that want me to answer your questions on the next Ask Andrea Go to my website. Don't go now. Wait until we're finished. We got a, you know, about another 25 minutes here. Um, go to my website, put in your question, and I'll answer them on the next Ask Andrea. But right now I'm getting to the questions that already came in. And then when I finish these, I'll scroll through and I'll get to the ones that are coming in live. Um, okay. So uh, I'm just going to check off the questions that I got to. So.
So this one says, uh, her name is Mrs. H, and she says, hello, I'm struggling to get pregnant. I got pregnant naturally last year, but then had a miscarriage at six weeks and then found that I have an underactive thyroid. Yeah, that makes sense. Ever since then, I, I have been taking levothyroxine and the doses just keep increasing. I recently failed my first round of IVF uh, with a chemical pregnancy too, so I'm really struggling to come to terms with not getting pregnant. What makes this worse is that I've just turned 43 and age is not really on my side. How can I make sure that my body is ready for pregnancy with thyroid issues? I would really appreciate your feedback. So Mrs. H, I don't know if you know about my thyroid program. I, it comes out in October and it comes out in um, April. So you, it's not available for you now, but you may want to hop on next year because what happens is so many of the girls that take my program, they get pregnant. Even if they're not trying to get pregnant, they get pregnant. Uh, so what you want to do is you have to nourish your endocrine system as a whole. You have to have those foods that are going to support, you know, the vitamin A and D rich foods that are going to support the functioning of the endocrine system. You have to reduce stress. Um, I would highly suggest getting um, Real Food for Mother and Baby by Nina Plank. It's a great book. Uh, you know, it'll teach you how to eat because you need to start to build your body. If you put a, an egg, a fertilized egg inside your body and it doesn't have the nutrition or the energy to support that egg, it's going to drop out of the body. So, you know, uh, and, and that's energetically speaking. So you want to make sure that you are supporting your endocrine system, vitamin A and D rich foods, lots of good fats, enough protein, enough of all the, the right nutrients, but also that you're reducing stress. Because if your stress is high, a baby won't come. You have to relax. Relax. The more relaxed you are, the easier time you're going to have. It, you'll be more receptive. Right? So when you're, res when you're relaxed, you're open, you're receptive, same thing happens internally. So uh, another thing you could do is actually take a vacation. <laughs> right? So take a vacation, have lots of fun, you know, go get crazy and uh, have some fun on the beach with your, with your sweetheart and relax, relax around it. 43 is, is not old. Uh, you could still, I, I know people that have had babies at 50 and 51 years old. So, uh, I mean, of course, it's not the ideal. You don't want to have a baby at 51 years old. Boy, would that be exhausting. You imagine? Oh, Lord. Mm. But, um, uh, you know, you, you could certainly get pregnant at 43. It's, it's not the end of the road. As long as you, you're ovulating, as long as you have eggs, you could certainly get pregnant. Um, okay. Uh, so, Laura, uh, Loris wrote in, she said, hair loss, she's almost bald on the top of her head and weight gain. She said, my blood work was low normal, not diagnosed at this time, but having these problems. Okay. So hair loss, almost bald on the top of the head. Uh, you know, each part of your head relates to a different organ system. So right here is bladder. This is bladder and kidney. And here is spleen. Right across the side of the head is gallbladder. You have gallbladder in the back here. You have stomach. <laughs> right stomach spleen along the top so besides high stress and uh hormones that are out of balance which will cause the hair to lose uh it could indicate that one of the organ systems is out of balance right so is the digestive system out of balance are you digesting properly if not you're not gonna you know your hair is not gonna stay on your head this is gonna be one of the first things to go same thing happens with thyroid patients right their eyebrows start to fall out because the, the body doesn't actually need this, right? It's not actually, so this is, your, your protein and all your other uh, nutrition is going to go toward keeping the body alive. So you have to look and say, okay, which one of my organ systems is out of balance? Or is it that my stress levels are really high? Because if your stress levels are high, it's totally going to throw your hormones out of balance and hair will fall out. It happens all the time. I see it with people suffering with adrenal fatigue, chronic fatigue, thyroid disease, um, you know, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, they start to get hair on the face, hair falls out of the head. Uh, so this is all stuff to be conscious of. Uh, Joan says, for some reason this video is pausing, so I cannot hear you. It's pausing on its own for a very long time. So please send a video later of this. Okay, Joan, I'll send a, a video later. Um, and Pablo, if you could make sure that this is actually uh, on Facebook and going up. <laughs> no, it didn't. That would be great. Okay. Um, all right. So Karen says she put in digestive health and too much sugar and how it relates to the thyroid. My 14 year old daughter has Hashimoto's and managing her diet is difficult. What foods or herbs do you recommend for a teenager? Well, first of all, Hashimoto's 
really has less to do with the thyroid and more to do with the digestive system. So any of the autoimmune thyroid conditions and autoimmune conditions in general, whether it's MS, lupus, um, uh, diabetes 1, right, all, and 2, right, all of this is, these autoimmune conditions are more connected to the digestive system than the actual organ itself. So one of the things that you have to do with Hashimoto's is you have to support the digestive system. So slow down when eating, chew your food. Digestion begins here, not here. You actually have to masticate the food, mix it with your saliva, mix it with um, uh, your enzymes. You know, we have uh, all of these enzymes that are secreted from the glands in the mouth that help you digest food. It starts here, it doesn't start here. So people with digestive distress and any type of autoimmune condition have to really sit down, relax, and chew their food before it gets into the body. Another thing that they could do, especially with Hashimoto's, I recommend black walnut hull or doing some type of uh, bacterial wipe, <laughs> right? right? Cleaning out the digestive system from all of the, the crap, you know. Um, and black walnut hull is one of my favorites for Hashimoto's because it really starts to um, get the bacteria in check as well as tone the intestines. Um, Marissa says, my hairdresser says, I have a lot of new hair growth. I worked on my thyroid with your help. Oh, great. That's awesome, Marissa. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's great. I love hearing that. As long as the hair isn't growing out of your ears and growing out of your nose, right? <laughs> All these weird places, right? You want it growing in good places. So that, that's wonderful. Um, okay. Uh, also, uh, to the question of uh, too much sugar and how it relates to the thyroid, when the thyroid is talking to the body and the thyroid says we need energy, it's triggering a reaction to get the sugar into the cells. So if the body needs energy, sugar needs to be pushed into the cells. So is the person under stress, right? Because when stress levels go up, boom, sugar's getting pushed into the cells very quickly. So you have to say, what's going on with this person? Do they have high stress? Are they chronically getting high sugar because of their stress levels? Um, are they not utilizing that sugar? Because once the sugar goes into the cells, you have to use it. Otherwise, guess what's going to happen? Uh, if you don't use the sugar in the cells, meaning if you don't go for a run, if you're stressed, bye, I got this craziness going on, and don't go for a run, and go work that out, or get that sugar out of your system, the next time that you have stress, eventually your cells are going to say, no, no more sugar. I don't want, I'm, I'm not using this sugar as it is. Um, please don't give me any more sugar. Insulin, I'm not letting you in. Uh, right? Because insulin is the key that unlocks the cell that lets the sugar in. So uh, insulin's not going to be allowed in and you're going to have high blood sugar as well as um, uh, sugar, blood sugar imbalances. So this is, this is something to be conscious of because so many people don't even think about, well, I'm stressed and that's why my sugar's high. Uh, but that's probably part of it. Okay. So next question was from Carrie. And Carrie says, I want off the medication. I guess she's talking about thyroid medication. Or I don't know what she's talking about. Because <laughs> it doesn't really say, I want off the medication. I don't think it's working for me unless you're looking at the bad side effects I have. How can I do that and not gain even more weight and my body not go out of control? Okay, so I don't know what medication you're on. Uh, but, um, you know, and until I know that, I can't really help you out with that situation. Um, okay. So another question came in from Jeanette, and Jeanette says, uh, hi, Janine. <laughs> uh, yeah, her weight won't budge. Yeah, for those, I'm, I'm answering questions that came in through my website first, and then I'll get to you guys' questions uh, before the end. Let's see, 119. So on, the, on, my, on my, uh, my homepage on my website, actually on all my pages on my website, on the sidebar on the right side is something called Ask Andrea, and that's how these questions came in, right? All these questions that came in. They came in through Ask Andrea. So if you have a burning question, right, you need to know, put it into that question box and I'll answer it live in the next few weeks. Um, okay, so Jeanette's question was, what are your top five anti-inflammatory foods or supplements? And Jeanette, I don't generally recommend supplements. Um, I do recommend foods. And if I do ever recommend a supplement, it would be for a short period of time and then get off right? Short periods of time and then get off. And there's a reason for that. If you look at the history of supplementation, which is fairly young, this is a young, um, it's, it's a young practice supplements, 
maybe 50 years, 60 years old or something like that. Uh, we have a tendency to be like, we need vitamin C. Boom, everybody goes crazy with vitamin C. They're like, we need calcium for our bones. And boom, everybody goes crazy taking calcium, calcium, calcium. Right? And now we have this vitamin D. Everybody's going crazy for vitamin D. So I want you to start to look at the, the studies that are going on over the past, you know, like now that we've had calcium supplementation in the diet for, you know, 40 or 50 years, take calcium and it's good for your bones. Now, of course, we're finding over the past 10 years that those calcium supplements have been leading to higher rates of breast cancer, calcification of the soft tissue, um, calcification of the arteries, higher rates of heart disease. So um, careful with the calcium supplements. And you don't count all supplements because they're going to have a negative reaction because they're isolated nutrients. So it's one of the reasons why I recommend food. So I'm not saying don't take isolated nutrients. What I'm saying is, if you're gonna take them, take them for a short duration of time, get off, and then get back on again. Uh, don't continue to take them for years on end because it's gonna cause problems. It's gonna cause big problems. So, um, uh, so top five anti-inflammatory foods. Uh, I would say all of the leafy greens, and, and not just the big gigantic leafy greens that everybody loves and adores, right? Kale, right? Everybody loves kale. <laughs> um, but all of the leafy greens, um, you know, parsley, cilantro, uh, all, all of the you know, culinary herbs are actually anti-inflammatory, right? Uh, basil, um, rosemary, one of my favorites, I love rosemary, oregano, all of these anti-inflammatories, as well as rich in antioxidants. Um, Christina says, for some reason this video is not working, I'd love to hear what you're saying. I'm, oh, I'll send out a video, I'll send it out, um, well, it'll, when you can watch it later. <laughs> Maybe we're having a bad connection. Um, okay. So top five anti-inflammatory foods, greens, Fruits are fantastic anti-inflammatory, especially all of your berries, blueberries, blackberries, uh, goji berries, right? Um, uh, hawthorn berries. Oh my gosh, hawthorn berries I love. Uh, okay, so let's get to the next question. Uh, from Maria. Maria says, hi, Andrea. My name is Maria, and I'm an IIN graduate. I love watching you, thanks. I love IIN. Hi, <laughs> Yvette. Uh, she says, I have a cousin, Maria says, I have a cousin that just called me with a thyroid issue. She has cysts. What would you recommend her to do? Thank you. A couple of things. First is with cysts, any type of cysts. It doesn't matter if, um, oh, Paige, the video is working for you in Texas. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, I think maybe it's, it's people's connection, right? If they have a bad connection or the internet connection isn't strong, then they'll lose video. Uh, so let's go back to cysts, right? So she has cysts, a thyroid cyst. So any type of cyst, anywhere in the body, whether it's on the thyroid, in the ovaries, in the uterus, in the breasts, in the brain, cysts anywhere indicate generally that the liver is not detoxing generally. Like there are many types of cysts. So you want to make sure that the liver is in good health as well as the kidneys because liver and the kidneys are working together and liver and digestive, your whole body's working together. Um, but with cysts, there has to be a breakdown process that's happening, right? So there's a buildup process. You wanna make sure there's a breakdown process as well. So the liver is responsible for detoxification. It's also, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, we, we abuse it so much just by eating, <laughs> all right? So even eating the healthiest food in the world is causing uh, metabolic waste, right? So the, the liver has to ha break down all of the toxic residue because even in, let's say, a piece of kale or parsley, there's also toxic residue that has to be broken down. It has to be excreted either through the digestive system or through the urinary in the bladder. So for her thyroid cysts, the first thing you have to ask is, is the liver functioning properly? For any cyst, like I said, is the liver functioning properly? Is the detoxification system working well? Is phase one and phase two detoxification working, right? Is, is the liver and the gallbladder, are they producing the bile, stimulating the chlor hydrochloric acid, moving things through the digestive system? Or is it, are you having your phase two detox, which is, you know, you're turning your fat-soluble 
toxins into water soluble toxins that are going to be excreted through the urinary and the bladder you know like are you supporting that with sulfur rich compounds indol 3 broccoli right all all the great cruciferous vegetables that everybody loves right so you have phase one and phase two liver detox and both of them have to be nourished you need the bitter foods you need those sulfur containing foods you know you need those elements to make this system work well so um check on that with her also see if she's iodine deficient because a lot of times when people are iodine deficient their body will slow right the processes will slow so or she may be getting the wrong type of iodine um oh hi patricia oh you're working your video is working well too oh good good <laughs> all right so let me continue with this uh this one is done uh and then i'll get to your questions what time let's see what time we got here Oh, good, good. So I got, you know, about five more questions here, and then I'll, I'll scroll through and I'll get to your live questions. Okay. Um, my blood work checks out fine, but I have signs of my thyroid being off, dry skin, brittle hair. Is this possible? Can your books help me? Yeah, of course my books can help you. Yeah, if you're, you know, like what I what I teach in my, well, I just happen to have my, my book right here, Happy Healthy Thyroid. <laughs> but for example, um, many times people that have a, the adrenals, if the adrenals are not working well or they're stressed or they're overworked or um, they've been, they haven't been nourished properly, the thyroid will naturally slow down. All of your processes will naturally slow down. And that's the thyroid is actually saving your life. It's saying, okay, slow this human being down stop the processes she's going too fast or he's going too fast or i can't keep up with this um and it'll naturally slow so look to like you, you said your your tests have come out normal okay look to the adrenals are you overworked are you stressed are you getting the nourishment that you need are you getting your fat soluble vitamin e and e a e d and k to support your entire endocrine system what's are you absorbing your fats again now let's look to the liver right if the liver is not functioning well or the gallbladder is not functioning well, you won't be able to process your fats because bile, you, bile is the emulsifier, right? Bile needs to be excreted into the system to break down and emulsify those fats so you can absorb them. So what's happening? Are you eating the wrong type of fat? Not enough fat. Um, oh, Tracy. Yeah, I, I see questions. All right, I'll get to these questions. Uh, let, me, let me finish this. I get so distracted sometimes. Um, okay, so let me just check this one off. We got to this one, depression, motivation. Um, so this one is from Rick. And Rick says, I am a male in my late 50s, and I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease about six years ago, and I was told that my thyroid is dead. I've been on Synthroid... I've been on thyroid medication since Arma Thyroid for two years or so, and then Synthroid. I was always healthy before this diagnosis. Does your program have any positive results with curing such a condition, restoring a dead thyroid, and eliminating the need for such medication? Uh, yeah, you can find out about that program. Like I said, it's closed. It's, it closes in October. Uh, it opens again in April. You can find out about that next program in um, on my website. You go to andreabeeman.com, and you go on the program it, on the top bar it'll say programs and you scroll down and you look at uh you know for a thyroid program but i've had lots of people that have been told that their thyroid is dead right because they've had hashimoto's and it's been attacked and they have scar tissue but it takes time like sometimes years to heal uh hashimoto's but you have to start in the digestive system as i said earlier so like any autoimmune thyroid condition as well as any autoimmune condition lupus ms Hashimoto's, Graves, diabetes, right? All of these conditions, you've got to, psoriasis, right? Another autoimmune condition. You have got to look in the digestive system. What's going on? Why isn't this person processing their proteins properly? Um, do they have leaky gut? Has the digestive system been compromised with some type of overgrowth of bacteria, whether it's SIBO um, or fungal overgrowth in the case of Candida? Right, so all of these questions you have to ask. You just can't say, well, this is dead, right? It's still in a living body. Um, and cells are constantly being broken down and regenerated, right? So that's the process, that's yin and yang. 
And uh, I cover that stuff in depth in my New Healers Master Coaching Program, which is all about understanding the body from an energetic perspective, right? So you have growth and you have death, right? Or birth and death. And this is a natural process of life. And it's a natural process of our cells, right? Every single day we have cells that grow and we have cells that die. So in, and I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but in like the case of someone with cysts, right? We were talking earlier about cysts. Someone may be growing, but they may not be detoxing. They may not be breaking down. So you have to look at the processes. What's going on? Is something happening with the liver? Is something happening with the kidneys? Something happening with the digestive system? Where is that process stuck? Uh, in the case of the autoimmune conditions, what's happening with the digestive system? Can we seal up those holes, right, by uh, good bacteria, some collagen, some good quality proteins, good quality fats, you know, like uh, fermented foods? How can we start to support the digestive system so it can start the process of not attacking the other parts of the body, right? Not, not having all these little particles leaking out of the digestive system and going into the body because you know that the digestive system is supposed to be separate from the, from the body. It's a, it's a system and it's inside the body, but it's not supposed to leak into the body. There are other processes that have to happen. Um, so let me get to some live questions. There's a couple more on here that I'll get to. Uh, let me get to some live questions. Let's see. Okay, I'm scrolling all the way back. Uh, okay. Christine says, uh, my treat is dark chocolate, but it's not working for me. <laughs> Any other nighttime indulgences you can suggest? <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations, Christine, for recognizing that the dark chocolate isn't working for you. For some people, it causes acid reflux, um, heartburn, uh, you know, so uh, high, uh, heart palpitations, you know, all this stuff can happen. The mind too busy because it's, you know, a stimulant. Uh, it has uh, theobromine and, you know, uh, a lot of other stuff as well as the sugar. Uh, so for a nighttime indulgence, you know, I would suggest like, you know, maybe a cup of tea. You know, a cup of tea is a great nighttime indulgence and people just don't think about it as an indulgence. You know, like, like really make a catnip tea, chamomile, put a little bit of honey in there. Um, you know, have a, like I'm having a little apple cider today. Like, uh, uh, yesterday I had a little heartburn. So today I made a little apple cider with some kuzu root starch, some ginger, um, some uh, clove as well as star anise, right? So this is so soothing my gut today, soothing my gut. So I, I obviously was eating something that really didn't agree with me. So it's good, Christine, that you are paying attention to that stuff. So, you know, like we always reach out for the sweet, but why are you craving the sweet at night? Did you not get enough sweet foods in your dinner? Did you not get enough onion, carrots, squashes, parsnips? potato, which is also considered a sweet because it's a starch, right? Are you not getting enough sweets in your life, in, including love, right? Love is sweet. So um, are you lonely at night? You know, why are you having the sweet craving at night? What's going on? Can you read a book? Can you put your feet in some um, warm water? You know, take a, take a bath, a relaxing bath. But some way that you could wind down because chocolate's not going to wind you down at night, which you realize, right? It's going to speed you up. It's going to stimulate you. It's going to make the mind too active. You won't be able to sleep. Uh, so there's lots of other things that you can do. Um, okay. So... Uh, Vicky says, after shoveling, is warm water or warm coconut milk with caraben it better to warm me back up from the inside out? I think warm milk is, that's a, a traditional classic, right? So um, warm carob milk. I remember when I was growing up, it was warm hot cocoa with milk, right? Hot cocoa was made with milk. Um, so it's a very warming food, milk, when you heat it. When it's cold, of course, it's cooling to the system. But also what would be good to warm you back up after shoveling snow is to put some type of heating spice into that hot cocoa mix, right? Uh, or your hot carob mix. Put some ginger in there. Put some cloves, right? Put something that's going to warm it up a little bit more even. Um, you could even put some fat in there because fat is very warming. Uh, you could put coconut oil. You could put ghee. You know, you could put something like that. Okay. Uh, and it's also a great exercise, by the way, shoveling snow. But you got to be careful 
Uh, people have heart attacks in the winter time. Remember I said the bones get depleted in the winter time, but also the heart because the kidney and the heart are balancing each other. And if the kidney is in a deficient state, the heart fire will go out of balance. Boom, heart attack. Uh, you know, because the kidney is the water element. So lots of times you hear about, oh, Joe, Joe, so-and-so was shoveling snow. Boom, heart attack. And that's because his kidney element might have been deficient. Or this might have been the first time he's doing exercise in a long time. I got to do that darn snow, <laughs> right? Uh, so, uh, but I know, uh, Vicki, you're a pretty healthy gal, so you don't have to worry about that stuff. Um, Marissa, Marissa said, oh, hi, Marissa. Good to see you. During the colder season, is there a particular time of day that is better to eat fruit? Um, yeah, actually, fruit is, is great. You know, like, especially in the cold weather, it can be cooling, right? So you don't want to eat a piece of fruit and then go outside into the cold weather. If you're staying in, you're going to be enclosed indoors for a few hours in the warm indoor environment, a piece of fruit would be great. Uh, you know, and depending on where you live, so like right now, I'm in New York State, right? So it's apple and pear season. And there's, you know, look, I'm having apple, apple cider. I'm having a warm apple cider today with like ginger and like I said, cloves and all that stuff that was, that was in there, as well as kuzu to coat my stomach. So, you know, you can have fruit, but don't have a piece of cold fruit and then go outside. And certainly don't have, you know, tropical fruits right now in the winter time. It's probably not the most ideal. Stick with the fruits that are more indigenous to your environment, whether it's berries, apples, pomegranates, lemons, limes, depending on where you live. Uh, everybody lives somewhere else, right? Um, okay. Paige says... If you could tell a person who has rheumatoid disease, RA, shingles, and chronic migraines, two health tips, what would they be? Okay, let's take a look at that. RA, which is rheumatoid arthritis, is an autoimmune condition. So remember what I was talking about earlier? You got to look into the gut. What's going on with the gut? Is it in a, in a flaccid state? Has the muscle in the gut, has it been compromised in some way? And a lot of times this will happen with people eating out of season. Right, so eating out of season, if they're eating constantly cold foods and they're in a you know in a wintertime environment, right? Cold, cold foods all the time, the the environment internally is gonna get cold, and this is gonna cause it'll cause like um almost like a depression, um, as well as a cold feeling inside the body, right? Because cold, depressed state. Uh so you wanna make sure that you are warming up the body warm it up, heat it up. Um, for RA, um, shingles, which is, you know, of course you have these flares coming up to the skin, right? Another, here we go, immune system. Again, we're looking at that. You have to look at stress. What is stressing this person out? When someone, when, when the fire comes up to the, to the external part of the body, right? This flashes of heat come up. It's showing, boom, inflammation is in here, but here it's coming right up to the surface. You've got to look at the immune system. You've got to look at the adrenals, yeah, which is regulating, right? Um, whether If you have an autoimmune condition, those adrenals are going to be on high all the time. Uh, you can drain the adrenals if you have an autoimmune condition. And how does that happen? Stress. So I know that we're always looking to food. It's the first thing that we look to, right? Most people, at least in the health and wellness world. We're like, we've got to have the number one thing that's going to make me feel better or uh, what's the one food or the top five anti-inflammatory foods, right? And meanwhile, we could be suffering from family stress, emotional stress, work stress, money stress, all life stress, uh, you know, uh, political stress, you know, whatever you have going on. And, and you know, you see it all over the place. Uh, I was just on the subway the other day and this one guy bumped another guy and boom, wow, it was like, to explosion, right? Well, you bumped into me in the subway. How you know, move over. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a subway. You you know, like you're you're gonna bump somebody. <laughs> right? That's that's a subway. That's you know, I think people are losing their minds. They're so highly stressed out and on edge and wired. Uh so we, we've gotta start to relax, relax. We're in the world with other people. It's crowded, right? It's crowded. You're gonna bump somebody, you may step on somebody's foot. Okay, it happens. And not the worst thing in the world. Uh, so with any uh, inflammatory thing that's happening, look to stress and see what's going on. When something pops up to the skin, where are you stressed? Um, okay. Uh, thanks, Sandy. Um, 
Oh, I think I just uh, I just skipped a whole bunch. Hold on. Um. Oh yeah, I just there's like a hundred thousand comments here. Here we go. <laughs> All right, I found the thing. Hold on. Uh. Uh, Joyoti says black. Did you say for Hashi's black walnut hull? It's an herb, and it helps to tone the intestines as well as keep the bacterial uh, the bacterial load in check. Like we have bacteria and we need them. We can't survive without them. Um, but when they grow out of control, we can have problems. You know, SIBO and all this other stuff. So that's what I recommend. Um, Joyoti says, what are your thoughts about soy protein powder or soy protein if one has Hashi's? I don't recommend it at all. Um, if somebody has Hashimoto's, right, they... They have, they're having trouble digesting and absorbing proteins. So I don't recommend those soy proteins, those isolated soy proteins, especially not with a thyroid condition. Um, soy can inhibit the, uh, the processing of protein. It has to be processed properly. So like if you're going to have soy, have it in the form of miso, shoyu, natto, uh, the traditional forms of, of soy, not the modern forms. I think the modern forms are probably what's, making so much thyroid disease rampant around the world. And I would suggest other forms of protein, especially long cooked proteins. So like, um, I, I would never suggest for somebody with um, uh, Hashimoto's to have grilled chicken, right, with vegetables. Even though grilled chicken with vegetables could be really healthy, they'd actually need something like a uh, simmered chicken, simmered for a long time so that those proteins are really soft and easy to digest and not, you know, because when you grill something, you're tightening the proteins. You're making it actually even harder. Uh, you're having this effect. When you're simmering something on the stove in the form of a braise, right, a braise, you're cooking it for a long time and it's opening up, relaxing all those proteins, really making them easy to, to digest. So you have to look at traditional, again, traditional foods. If somebody had a wasting disease, they weren't given a steak, <laughs> right? They weren't given a steak. They were even stocks, right? Bone stocks. So a bone stock is, you know, this is the, the simmering of the bones for how many hours? Hours and hours. And you're extracting all of those nutrients, making them really easy to digest. So for, for a condition like Hashi's, I don't recommend those isolated soy proteins or even those pea proteins. I don't recommend any of that stuff. It's hard to digest. Uh, Janine says, I'm eating organic, whole foods, lots of veggies. I do some form of workout and deep breathing every day and my weight won't budge. I feel defeated. Um, you may be eating the right foods, but again, stress could be high and you may not, not have enough fat. So what I find with clients that can't lose weight is I tell them to eat fat and, you know, you know, good quantities of it, like butter in their vegetables, uh, olive oil, you know, just lots, lots of more fats because when your, when your body gets what it needs, it starts to release what it doesn't need. If it doesn't get what it needs, it's always going to hold on. It's going to hold tightly. Um, so that's something to be conscious of. And let's see how we're doing on time. 143. Okay. So Chris, uh, got that. Uh, Heather says cysts are different than nodules. Yeah. Nodules, you know, Anytime that you have a growth, let's just talk about growths, right? So a goiter, right, which is a growth, is an enlarged nodule, right? It's an inflamed enlarged nodule. And for those of you that know about my previous condition, right, I, I used to have thyroid disease. I had a big nodule, a big goiter, right? You see that? A goiter, that gigantic neck, <laughs> right? So that's a nodule that is inflamed. Um, and... You're going to have growths and cysts and nodules that come up and go down and come up and go down and come up and go down. So when we, if you have a, a nodule or a cyst or a growth that is growing and growing and growing and growing, then you have to look at the detoxification phases in the body and say, what's going on? How come this body isn't releasing? Why is this inflamed? What's going on? Is the lymphatic system congested? Is the liver not working well? Is phase one and phase two detox detoxification of the liver, is that not working well? Um, you have to look at all of the, the systems in the body, not just the growth, 
right? The growth is just a symptom of something that's happening inside the body. So like even people with, um, like I've had women with breast lumps and breast cancer, right? Which is a growth. Um, so they, this, I always look to the gallbladder and the liver meridian, which runs up the side of the body. So what's happening? Are they not processing fats? Are they not detoxing? Um, I've had, uh, women with breast lumps said once, you know, I just tell them like simple things like, you know, take away the, uh, aluminum from the, uh, you know, sweat. I tell them to sweat, like take out the antiperspirant and just have a deodorant. And I had one gal who had a lump in her breast who didn't sweat for 16 years. So your integumentary system, right? That's the sweat system and all that stuff is not discharging the debris. So there's going to be accumulation. There's going to be blockage. So this area it gets blocked, right? It gets blocked the whole entire meridian. So one of the things that I love about ancient medicine and, and like TCM and traditional Chinese medicine and ancient J Japanese medicine and all the, the old stuff is that they looked at the body as a whole. So just because there's a lump here or a lump here or a lump here, you have to look at the whole body and say, okay, well, what's going on with the organ systems? What's going on with the liver? What's going on with the kidneys? What's going on with the digestive system? How about the colon? Is that discharging, right? You have to look at the whole body as a whole system and not just one little tiny piece. And I think when we look at the one little tiny piece, that's when we get into trouble, right? We focus on the one piece. And, and I remember studying um, metaphysics a long time ago, and, uh, and it was what you put your attention on grows, right? So if you have one cyst or lump or nodule, you put your attention on that, boy, that's going to grow. And I think that's what happens in, in modern medicine. They focus on the disease, and that's going to grow. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, Nida says, what type of supplements do you recommend for someone that doesn't have a thyroid anymore? Um, I actually recommend um, you get on some type of thyroid hormone, right? So uh, if you don't have a thyroid, you, you know, definitely take, take some, some form of uh, levothyroxine or um, nature thyroid or west thyroid or, you know, some type of thyroid hormone so that you could feel a little more balanced because you may always feel hypo without your thyroid. You may always feel depressed, overweight. Um, you know, all that stuff. Uh, okay. Oh, Terry says, I want to sign up for the April sessions. Uh, yeah, Terry, you can sign up for the April sessions. You go to my website. Um, and I know Stephanie's here and she could put the link in for you, uh, for my, um, I don't, I don't think you can actually get access to it. You could get on the list and we'll let you know when the next session is available. The, uh, the April session to join the nourishing thyroid program. Um, hi, Nikki. <laughs> uh, Tracy says, left tonsil is swollen for two years. ENT says it's not a big deal, but he cannot, but he can remove it. Not a great answer. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Yeah, I agree. That's not a great answer. If your left tonsil has been swollen for two years, this right here, your tonsils are the beginning of this is where your immunity, right? So your tonsils are part of your immune system and it's like the first stage of the immune system which has direct access to the outside world, right? To pathogens, to viruses, to bacteria, right? So if it's swollen, something's going on. Something's going on in the immune system. Either the lymphatic system is sluggish, right? Because you know, lymph lymphatic system goes through the body and clears all the debris, right? And gets all that stuff going. So what's happening? Is the lymphatic system sluggish? Uh, are you, is any of your teeth infected, right? So sometimes you could have like um, a root canal that's infected or a gum that's infected and you're constantly, there's, there's constant fighting going on. So I don't agree with the ENT that having a swollen tonsil for two years is okay. I, I think that that's a sign that you got to get some things moving. <laughs> um, Hillary says, uh, oh, and by the way, for those of you that are interested in learning more about healing the whole body, uh, I do have my new Heal is Master coaching program, and that comes up every January. So it's coming up January 2017, and we have early bird discount. Um, and it's, uh, if you go to my page, uh, and you go to my, not my page, you go to my website, andreabeeman.com, and you click on the programs, you'll see New Healers Master Coaching Program. And that's where I teach about the organ systems and the meridians and the chakras and the diagnosis of understanding and assessing condition, 
not not like um not like a doctor you're assessing from an ancient point of view as the body as an entire whole system and um, when, when you see the body as a whole system, then you say, oh, yeah, I could use this herb, I could use this piece of food, I could use this li lifestyle change to try and shift the system and make the body more balanced. Um, so if you go to that and you put in ASK NHMC 200, you get $200 off, and that's an early bird special. And that class will be launching, that program is launching, it's about four months, and it's launching um, in January, the end of January. And it's a lot of fun, that class. Because, uh, you know, you bring in pictures of your face, and I got this going on, and I got that going on. Uh, and and we, we discuss it in the, in the you know, whether it's for you or for your clients, if you're a health coach. I, I, I found this information invaluable for me as I'm working with my clients, right? So if they show up and they say, I got this going on, and I got that going on. I got this little ache in the pain. I got a pain in my knee. Right? If they have a pain in their knee, I'm like, okay, let's look at the kidneys. Right? So... Uh, in Western medicine, the pain in the knee, you, you have to go to the, um, I forgot what, the osteopath or something like that. But in, in Eastern medicine, the pain in the knee means let's look at the kidneys. Let's see what's going on with the kidneys. Um, okay, so Hillary says stiffness and pain in arms, not being able to grip. This is all connected to my thyroid. I still still feel ill on 75 milligrams. Yeah, um, actually not being able to grip. This is your liver is responsible for the tendons, the tightness in the tendons, right? So something's happening with phase one or phase two detox inside your body. Uh, as well as, uh, of course, you know, or I hope you know, that there's a direct connection between thyroid and, um, and liver, right? Liver and thyroid, direct connection. So the, the liver, as well as anything that's happening hormonally inside your body, um, the liver is responsible for when your hormones are breaking down, right? We, we have hormones that are, your endocrine system is, is a hormone system, a communicate, com communication, communication <laughs> system. It's constantly talking to all the different systems, you know, like speed up, slow down, keep moving, right? All this stuff, digest, rest, sleep, all these things is happening inside the endocrine system. And when those hormones have been used and they now need to be discarded, uh, that's where the liver comes in and it's breaking down those hormones and putting them into the phase one detox phase two to go out through the kidneys to be excreted through the uh, urinary. And then of course the fat soluble hormones are going to be excreted through the digestive system. So the ones that, that have already been used. So if there is problems in the liver, then the thyroid will always be out of balance. And that's, that's just, that's just the way that it works, you know? So, uh, okay, let's go here. Oh, again, so whoop, let me go back. Uh, stiffness and pain in the arms, go and get some body work. Get some body work, work this out, right? These tendons, this is controlled by the liver. That's why people with carpal tunnel syndrome, actually, they actually need to work on their liver, uh, the health of the liver. Um, and right now we're going into the, the season of the kidneys, right? Wintertime, season of the kidneys. So people may, like I said, be feeling more stiffness in the actual bones rather than the muscles. So if you're feeling stiffness in the bones or achiness in the bones, you have to look to the kidneys. Um, Marianne says, and let me just double check my time, 153. I got to wrap this up. Marianne says, do you have a good resource where we can see at a glance which food provide which vitamins and minerals? Um, no, actually, I, I don't um, generally, like once in a while, I'll, I'll talk about like specific vitamins and minerals, but I don't generally break down the food into their tiniest components. I try to bring it back to its whole, right? So, for example... Let's just say um, collard greens, right? So collard greens, they're rich in chlorophyll, right? They're, uh, they're rich in fiber, you know, they have a ton of stuff, uh, as well as vitamin C, right? So I don't break them down into their single components because then we start to think micro. It's, it's, a, it's almost like a collapsing of what the food is and what the food can do. So the, you lose the doctrine of signatures when you do that. So like doctrine of signatures is like, look at a collard green. What does it look like? Looks like a lung. Uh, helps to support the lungs. Can bring oxygen into the body via the chlorophyll, right? So uh, try not to look at food as a singular thing because that's what we did in the 70s and that totally messed us up right we started to look at isolated nutrients and i think that this is a big mistake uh because we're not isolated isolated nutrient factories we need more than just 
specific nutrients. We need the whole thing to work on the whole thing. Uh, you know, your body is a whole thing. <laughs> uh, Vicky says, I enjoy nut butter with carob and olive oil and ginger or cinnamon. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thanks for the spice. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Let's see, Sonia says, what food or supplements will encourage hair regrowth? Um, again, you have to look at, well, what's going on with the hair? Is the hair falling out because it's uh, seasonal, right? So for example, in the fall, the hair will have a tendency to fall as well as in the spring, right? So this is just a lot of old growth coming out and new growth coming. And also you're gonna lose a thousand hairs a day. So when people, uh, when people tell, when they start to freak out about hair loss, they're actually contributing to more hair loss because the stress will drop your hair. <laughs> so if you're stressing out about your hair, you're going to lose more hair. Um, so keep in mind that when you're lo like, look around, if you have animals, cats and dogs, they're shedding more in the spring and in the fall. Same thing is happening with human beings. We're shedding more in the spring and in the fall, literally shedding our hair. Um, and also this is a protein discharge, right? So if you are not eating enough protein or you're not absorbing your protein, then your hair can also break, fall, split ends, the whole thing. Um, so, uh, and look at, look at all this gray. Oh my gosh, I'm going, rolling up on 50. <laughs> I'm rolling up on 50. I got my natural ash highlights here. <laughs> the universe is like, here you go. You've been living. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I think we're almost done. Martha says, uh, so love your energy. Oh, thanks. Uh, found you at IIN. You've been inspiring to me. Have my first home cooking class next week. Awesome. That is awesome. Uh, people need to learn how to cook. And I, I think when we left the kitchen in the 1930s and the 1940s to go to war, I think so many crappy things happened. We left the kitchen to go to work, right? And look what happened. Oh, Lord have mercy. So I'm going to suggest that we all get back in the kitchen, <laughs> go back in there, start to cook up some, some nourishing meals. Uh, okay. Uh, Yvette says, how long you recommend a person should use a black walnut hull? I generally recommend for 21 days, right? To do around, just in case they have, um, you know, some parasites or some, some stuff that's really stuck in there because they also have a life cycle with their, um, having their little eggs <laughs> right and all their stuff inside your body so i recommend 21 days usually three times a day and then stop but and, and through that time you also want to be recolonizing with good bacteria you want to be having your fermented and your cultured foods uh you want to be having some raw foods as well uh, whether it's raw parsley or scallions or whatever you're putting onto your food because in raw foods if you don't wash them with chlorine, which I can't believe people do that. If you don't wash them with chlorine and stuff like that, it's gonna contain also bacteria on it. That's actually good for the body. Um, okay. Oh, Cheryl, this will be the last one because it is 158. Ian says, should I be taking Synthroid? Ian, uh, <laughs> he's a cutie. <laughs> old, old friend. I, I don't know, I, I think a pint of beer works really well. <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside joke. Uh, okay, so Cheryl says, hi, my gallbladder was removed 10 years ago. What should I be eating? Um, well, you have to be conscious that when you're eating your fats, you're eating foods that also help to emulsify the fat. So for example, um, radishes, great. Radishes, you know, they any of, any of the pungent spicy foods would also help to help you absorb those fats, break them down and absorb them just in their, in their energy, right? Their, their spiciness, their dispersive, their opening. Um, so, you know, red radishes, daikon radish, any, anything in the radish family uh, would really be beneficial. Uh, horseradish, you know, horseradish is really spicy, really, really good too. And it's great for phase two liver detox. Okay, so it is... Uh, it's two o'clock. I want to thank everybody for entering your questions on my website. So for those of you that didn't get your question answered today, you go to my website, go to the front page on the right hand side. There is an ask Andrea, put in your, your questions. I'll get to those first. Like these people put in, um, their questions in October and November and December. And I just got to them and, uh, and I'll, I'll answer the questions on the next, uh, the next live feed. 
and I want you all to have, I mean, a fantastic holiday season. Eat well, nourish yourself, enjoy. I see all the little hearts and the thumbs up. I'm sending you guys a whole lot of love and all that good stuff. Have a happy holiday season, and I'll speak to you soon, and thanks for joining me live. Okay, bye.